joining us today. On behalf of the Radiology Society of Rio de Janeiro and OCAD, I want to welcome and thank you all. My name is Aline Serfati, and I'm here with Dr. Hilary Humans, who coordinates and moderates this series with me. Our guest speakers today are Dr. Lucas da Gama Lobo, um, Dr. Diego Lemos, Dr. Francisco Abaité, and Dr. Uh, Dr. Marcos Loreto Sampaio. The speakers will present their cases and at the end, we will have a Q&A session. If you have questions at any time during their presentations, please put them in the chat box. And at the end, the speakers will respond to them. The presentations today will be recorded and available on demand on the OCAD website, which is ocadmsk.com, and also on the YouTube channel of the Radiology Society of Rio de Janeiro. If you want to join the OCAD community and see challenging cases almost every day, please consider registering on the OCAD website. A quick reminder, attendees have not been given the permission to screen record any of these presentations as they may contain material under copyright. Unauthorized recording use distribution and sale of this material without permission from the speaker is illegal. We thank you for your understanding and with that, I will kick off the session. We have the pleasure of having here today, Dr. Francisco Abaeté. He's an associate professor of musculoskeletal radiology at Christus University Center in Fortaleza, Ceará, Northwest Brazil. He completed residency, uh, his musculoskeletal fellowship as well as doctoral degree at Ribeirão Preto Medical School, University of Sao Paulo. He is the section head of MSK Image and director of the MSK Fellowship Program at Antonio Prudente Hospital in Fortaleza. He's also very involved in MSK radiology education, having presented at radiology national and international conferences. He's interested in all areas of MSK image and intervention with emphasis on sports medicine. He's also a member of the International Skeletal Society. And he's a very good friend of mine and also a great collaborator in several educational projects here in Brazil. Please, Abaita, share your screen. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here and I'd like to thank Dr. Alini and Dr. Hiller for inviting me. It's a pleasure and a special pleasure to be talking about sports imaging. It's the main focus of my work here on a daily basis. So I, I like very much this talk. And, and thank you very much for the kind presentation. Here are my social media. Uh, if anyone wants to keep in touch. And how I said, I work, uh, almost every day with uh, sport medicine uh, exams. I'm part of the medical department of uh, uh, soccer team, a professional soccer team here, also football team and basketball team. And so we uh, are involved in this uh, multi-modality evaluation of these patients and also procedure uh, in, sports, in sports medicine. Uh, and so I will talk a little bit about this, this next slides. There we have a, a, a ultrasound department inside the medical department of the, the team. And when we need uh, more exams like MRI or uh, more uh, complex uh, procedures, we send the, the player to an outpatient facility that you can perform uh, and follow up the end. So to our uh, two-day case, it's uh, very interesting because it was uh, from two days ago. It's a 25 years old male, professional soccer player that uh, developed severe pain and swelling in the proximal region of the leg after direct trauma. It was uh, a tangential uh, trauma less Wednesday in the during the game. Uh, so it's less than 48 hours now from the trauma. And yesterday he performed an MRI. And when I was preparing uh, the presentation, I saw this case and I decided to change the case because I thought it was interesting 
uh, to discuss the topic of this case, not because it's a rare case, but because it's an uncommon uh, location of a uh, not uh, rare situation. And I've, I, I thought it would be interesting to discuss uh, and review this topic. So this is the, the MRI of this prayer. It was performed, how I said, less than 24 hours after the trauma. So it's a, in an acute phase. It's up about 12 hours after the trauma. And here it's a, a axial plane and a fluid sensitive sequence with fat suppression of the leg. And here we have a, a, a finding that it's a very easy to, to detect. But you can see here uh, a dissociation between the superficial fascia and the deep fascia here on, on the uh, muscle uh, compartment and the, the superficial muscle compartment here. So you can see this degloving injury in the anteromedial aspect of the leg. And here is, you see the subcutaneous uh, dissociated from this uh, deep fascia. And one of our uh, interesting findings here is this uh, fat uh, tissue and small nodules inside this fluid collection, inside this effusion here. It's a, a, a very specific uh, finding of the situation. We also can detect here associated a muscle contusion in the medial aspect of the solar muscle. Uh, but the other uh, muscle planes here are preserved. In this coronal image, also a fluid sensitive uh, sequence with fat suppression, we can uh, see the extension from top to bottom of this lesion, it's almost uh, 16 to 17 centimeters long. And here I draw uh, this small fat nodules here and this fat tissue inside this fluid collection, inside this effusion here. So uh, with this, uh, uh, Image, I think you already know the diagnosis. How I said, it was not a, a uncommon diagnosis, but it's in an uncommon a place, an uncommon location, how we will see in the next slides. So it's a, it's a Morel Lavallee lesion. It was classically uh, described in the type. It was uh, first described by a French physician in 16, uh, 1863. And uh, it's a lesion that develops in soft tissue, resulting in an emolymphatic collection between the fascial planes, the superficial and the deep fascia. But it can also uh, be found in different locations, not only in this classic one. It was also called closed internal degloving injury, or post-traumatic soft tissue cyst, or Morel-Lavalle effusion or chronic expanding hematoma. This is the classic location of this finding. So you have this uh, deep fascia here, that's the fascia lata, and it has also a superficial fascia here. And when you have this dissociation, you have the degloving here, we can uh, uh, find the Morel Lavalle lesion. Here we'll re review the mechanism of, uh, of this injury and the specific anatomy of this region so you can, we can understand how it occurs. These illustrations are cross-sections of the tissues layers from the skin to the bone and demonstrates a cheering force that can cause uh, a relatively mobile subcutaneous uh, moves uh, relatively to these uh, deeper tissues that are uh, fixed and then you have shearing forces in these vessels that may be uh, arteries or veins or also lymphatic vessels. And these shearing forces can uh, cause 
uh, lesions of these vessels, and then they can accumulate here uh, this fluid collection that may be hematic or hemolymphatic, and depending on the proportion of different vessels that are uh, involved in this lesion. They are frequently uh, identified in hours after the trauma, how in our case, but it may be uh, uh, depending on the mechanism of the trauma and the location, it may be diagnosed just after days or even uh, months. It can be uh, isolated, an isolated lesion, but often uh, we can find fractures uh, associated. And here in this image, we can see the most common places or potential sites of Morello Lavalle lesions. And as you can see, the most common places are in the tight and also surrounding the knee. But here in the leg, it's not common. It's uh, between uh, uncommon or a rare location of this lesion, as also in the dorsal region, the shoulder, or in the head. Melado and Bencardino uh, described a classification, an MRI classification for this kind of lesion. As we can see here in this picture, the type one is a seroematic uh, effusion, a seroma, very homogeneous here. The type two, it's a subacute hematoma. Type three, it's a chronic organizing hematoma. Uh, type four, it's a perifacial dissection with laceration, with fat laceration. Type five, it's a perifacial nodule, uh, pseudo nodule lesion. And type five, it's an infected lesion, okay? It's a chronic and infected lesion. I brought uh, another case from the literature uh, just to illustrate here uh, another case in the leg. Here uh, with a, uh, is a seven, uh, 57 years old man with lateral uh, cough swelling post trauma. It's a type two Morel Lavalle, as you can see here, uh, subacute hematoma. There's another uh, place, it's also very common in uh, surrounding the knee. Here uh, in the medial aspect of the knee, we can uh, see the ultrasound in correlation with the MRI. And it's also, it, this is a, a type one. It's a very homogeneous uh, uh, fluid collection. And the treatment for Morella Valley lesions depends on the stage at which the lesion is detected. And we can see bending, aspiration, or uh, incision and evacuation of the lesion. And the image methods can have an important role here to guide the aspiration and to guide procedures. So uh, I have only 10 minutes. It's, uh, I will uh, end my presentation here, but I'd like just to uh, the, uh, just uh, just remember some points, uh, take home points. Morel Lavalle are closer deglobing type injuries that results uh, from post-traumatic hemolymphatic effusions. Classic described on the type, but I also can see in other sites, mm -hmm. sites like uh, knee, cough, and lumbar regions, how was in our case. The severity of the traumatic process uh, leading to the formation of Morel Lavalle lesion uh, will differentiate from acute to chronic uh, lesions depending how the patients evaluate. So it's not only important to make the diagnosis, but also follow up uh, these patients with image methods so you can see if this fluid collection will be absorbed and, and the patients will have a good prognosis or if it will chronify or even uh, can be infected and you have some problems with that. And the uh, evolution of the blood, uh, blood products, fat content, and formation of granulation tissues are important determinants for the late and chronic appearance of the Morella Valle lesions. So it's a very important to the uh, radiologist to know this, this diagnosis, to remember the different kinds of presentations, even if you don't want to classify but you must know the different kinds of 
presentations and the different phase of evolution in, of this uh, kind of lesion. So you can uh, describe uh, in the best way you can, okay? So thank you very much for the, the your attention. And here are my social media contacts for any doubts. And in the end of the presentation here, we will, in, at the end of the section, we'll have a, a Q&A uh, so you can ask anything. Thank you very much. Hi, good morning, everybody, uh, or good afternoon. Uh, I'm Hilary Humans. It's my pleasure to introduce my friend Marcos Loreto Sampaio, who's a uh, who is the musculoskeletal uh, ultrasound lead at the Ottawa Hospital of the University of Ottawa in Canada, where he was the former musculoskeletal fellowship program director. He's a musculoskeletal radiologist with a special interest in both uh, ultrasound um, and uh, MRI techniques. His research has focused on imaging of spondyloarthropathy, neuromuscular disease, dynamic ultrasound, and Dixon MRI technique. He was previously voted best radiology teacher by students, residents, and fellows at the University of Ottawa. Uh, he holds a degree in electronic engineering and is an amateur musician. So um, I'm looking forward to the best teacher teaching us something about sports imaging. Share your screen, Marcos. Thank you so much, Hillary. Yes. Uh, okay. So let's see here. Um, please, can you just confirm if you can see my PowerPoint presentation? Yes. Yes. Thank you so much. Thanks for the introduction, Hillary. Thanks, uh, Hillary and Alini, uh, for for the invitation to participate. Is my my first participation with the, the Rio de Janeiro Society of Radiology and OCAD to present cases like this. So uh, it's a real pleasure. Thank you so much. And let's get started. So um, this is the, the team of MSK RADS here at Ottawa. Um, for you to have an idea, and I don't have anything to disclose. So today we're going to talk about this, this person here. So 30 years, 38 years old, um, he presented at the ER with a history of recent onset of pain, at the proximal kind of anterior aspect of the arm, delta pectoral region, uh, bodybuilder, very strong guy, and clinically it was a quitty pec major tear. Um, at the ER, we end up doing an ultrasound of that person. Usually here, we do have the sonographers doing the study, and we go there to help and to, you know, do whatever else we need. Now, being a ultrasound of the pectoral is major. Um, I mean, it's one of those that doesn't really come every day. Uh, and uh, it's normal for us to be a bit unfamiliar with the anatomy and whatever we should be looking uh, for there. Right, so let's quickly review. Uh, let's let's put everyone on the same page. Let's say in terms of, of how to uh, how to assess it, and then we're going to see the images. Okay, so we're going to spend a couple of minutes talking about the anatomy and the appearance of pec major in ultrasound. We'll do this uh, pretty briefly and directly. Uh, simplifying anatomy, we see the humerus uh, in this region, the humeral head here. We have the clavicle, the manubrium, and the sternum, and then we have the the very large sternocostal head of the of the pectoralis major which uh, the origin all along this medial margin here and the tenon there attached at the humerus laterally to the bicipital groove and superiorly and somewhat more superficially in relation to it you do have the clavicular head with that kind of orientation as you see the orientation of the fibers counts a lot when we're doing this study it's going to help us now the most inferior fibers of the sternocostal uh, head are called the uh, abdominal lamina of the muscle. And as you can see, the fibers, as they converge to become the tendon, you have a very short myotendinous junction here. Uh, as, as that happens, they have this really, you know, uh, tilted angle here, okay, to the attachment. Um, while the more central uh, fibers, they kind of go more uh, linearly, let's say, they're not too much angulated 
okay, the same about the clavicular uh, fibers. When we do cross-sectional imaging of that level of the tendon, let's take a look at what we see. This is going to be important for our sonographic images. So that's the humerus. This is the bicipital groove, a bit exaggerated at the level of the attachment, but it makes it easier to understand. This is the bicipital tendon there. Um, and then we're going to have the deepest layer of that pectoralis major tendon. That is exactly that contribution of the abdominal lamina, those most inferior fibers. Okay. Uh, and then we have that manubrial lamina, still the sternocostal head, those more central fibers and more cranial fibers, uh, providing us with a somewhat little more superficial layer of the tendon. And finally, we do have the fibers of the clavicular head, which are going to be even more superficial, typically. Now, as you can see at the attachment, things change a little bit, and we tend to have what is so-called a bilaminar tendon and attachment. So we end up having a deeper, deepest layer or posterior layer with that abdominal lamina contribution and a more superficial one with uh, all fibers together from the maneuver lamina and the clavicular head. Uh, the tendon is quite thin, measures around 0.5 centimeter in thickness on average. Um, good. So now when we are recognizing the anatomy in, in any, any modality, that's another important relation here. Um, we can, the maneuver, the sternal head is very easy, right? You just position your transducer or you're looking at your image, it's a very large muscle anterior in the, in the, in the chest. Now the clavicular head, you can get a bit stuck and get, you can have some confusion there. So a good landmark is the cephalic vein. The cephalic vein actually separates the deltoid more laterally from the clavicular head more medially. And it's a very good landmark as you're going to see in a, in a second. That tendon has variable thick uh, extension, uh, I mean length, from one to five centimeter in most people. Good. All right, so that's a nutshell of anatomy. So how do we do that in ultrasound? How does it look like? If we position our transducer like that, at the very attachment of the tendon, that's what you should be seeing. The humerus, the tendon of the long head here, and the tendon, as we discussed, uh, directly medially. <clears throat> if you keep moving your transducer more medially, you are going to be able to follow the myotendons junction here. That's the sternal myotendons junction. You can see that clavicular head a little more superficial. That's the myotendons junction of the sternal head. And if you keep going medially, you're basically following the muscle fibers. For the clavicular head, let's start with that uh, transverse image. So we have the cephalic vein here, then laterally to the deltoid, and medially to the clavicular head. Now, when I, uh, I flip my transducer and it's now longitudinal to the clavicular head fibers, I can see its origin at the clavicle. I can see the fibrillar pattern there. I can follow it distally right towards the myotendons junction it gets very difficult at this area here okay close to the attachment but that's what it should be looking like and in depth you're going to be seeing a somewhat perpendicular image of the other head of the sternal uh, head deeper to the clavicular head very good okay so let's see our case now um Patient pointed out the area of tenderness, and he said, I think it's here. And that was more or less still the region of the muscle, kind of close to the myotendons junction. The, the sonography started there, okay? My suggestion to you, if you're doing a case like this, actually do the contralateral side first and kind of prime your eyes and your, you know, your whole feeling for the anatomy, and then you go to the abnormal side. But he started like that. So, but anyways, what we see, there's some kind of distortion of the anatomy here, some kind of loss of a nice shape of muscles and that fibrillar pattern. We see some long axis of the clavicular head and maybe what looks like sternal head here, but I don't see fluid. Then the next image we were provided is a long axis of the clavicular head, right? So fibrillar pattern here, that's normal and deeper to it. There's something funky happening here. And as we saw in that anatomic, anatomical image, that should be the um, sternal head contribution. There's something happening there. Uh, a little more of the same clavicular head here, but now the the transducer was uh, rotated, and now we are seeing what should be the long axis of the myotendons junction of the sternal head. So the person is trying to figure out what's the myotendons junction, what's the tendon here. Whatever is there is really heterogeneous. 
finally the tendon appeared yeah but it's still heterogeneous there's some kind of hypercogenic lines there and what's happening right uh, but anyways there seems to be something in continuity from that myotendon junction to the attachment looks like the tendon not fluid could not really be uh, seen around it um, and with some good we we might even maybe be able to separate some kind of layer some kind of contribution of the clavicular head tendon and the rest of the the tendon with the sternal head but anyways, there was something really heterogeneous there. And at that point, the sonographer was really lost. Okay. Uh, and uh, the radiologist was called to take a look at, at, at the case. Uh, when we follow to the insertion, again, we see this, what looks like a hyperechoic line going together with the tendon. But anyways, at this point, we think the tendon is in continuity at least, and there is not a collection, which is a good thing. Um, to make things a little worse, when the transducer is rotated, uh, along the long axis of the humerus at the very attachment of the tendon that was seen some kind of uh, you know there's a well-defined structure here with intense acoustic shadow and close to it there are again those hyper hyperechoic lines so let's see that this is a long axis of the tendon i mean a short axis of the tendon i'm going to run it again and let's look so we're coming from the myotendon's junction there are those hyperechoic lines and we're going towards the, the attachment itself and we get to the attachment here so my attendance junction here at the center of the screen then some hyperechoic lines then we get really close to the bone there is that thing there with a shadow then it looks like we got to the attachment we keep seeing the humerus now and at the other side of the humerus look at that there's something coming out from the other side right so some of you already know what's that and some of you might be pretty lost maybe and say what is happening right what's that now that's a short axis of the human so long axis of the tendon we see from the top to the bottom we are going to be able to follow the tendon substance and the attachment let's see again some hyperechoic foci this is the tendon itself going there right and the humerus and if we go back here you see those hyperechoic lines directed along the tendon substance toward the, the, the bone, right? Towards the humerus. Huh, interesting. So what do you think is happening there? Well, at this point, the patient turns out to the sonographer and says, oh yeah, actually I had a surgery there two years ago. So the, <laughs> then the sonographer says, oh, okay, thank you, sir. But you know, come on, sir. Why didn't I tell you that first? Ha, huh, very funny, right, Indiana? Yeah, why didn't you tell that first? But, so the patient says, well, I just forgot. And then when he looks at the patient, he says, um, yeah, actually, no worries, my friend. Yeah, that happens every day. You know, nothing to be worried about. But anyway, so we're, of course, not angry, but we figured out what was happening there. So we're talking about um, sutures uh, and reinsertion of the pectoralis major tendon, and we're seeing a plate, a mini plate, at the edge of the attachment and then we have uh, tunnels in the bone and we have the suture at the other side explaining all those findings but the tendon at the end of the day was in continuity there was distortion of the anatomy which is kind of expected in a case like this but there was nothing really major nothing surgical so our conclusion for the ER uh, physician and the orthopod was that yeah there's nothing there's no re-op involved here he might have some kind of minor strain of something there and the patient uh, was then dismissed. Good. So just as a complement in 30 seconds, uh, an MRI imaging of a similar case, post-op case. Um, pectoral is major here. Susceptibility artifacts telling you that it was a surgery with a repair and a um, bit of hard time to find the tenor in this case. But there was not, there was maybe some residual findings here, uh, but not really an evident uh, a retraction of the tendon. Um, the same patient that I just showed you, the MRI, that was the original injury. Uh, you see the uh, complete full thickness tear of both the clavicular head and also the sternal head. And very good. And at times, when you're talking about chronic tears, which is kind of what we're doing here today, and post-op changes, you might be seeing fat infiltration, uh, even if it's, you know, it's, um, still kind of there's some functionality uh even in partial tears you might see some areas of fat infiltration 
And that can be seen, of course, in the ultrasound too, like in this example, just see some distortion of the anatomy and loss of volume and usually hyperechoic errors at that region. Good, so I hope you found that interesting and that's it. Let me find my video again. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lucas Lobo. He earned his medical degree at the University, Federal University of Bahia and completed his radiology diagnostic residence at Hospital, Hospital do Serviço Público Estadual de São Paulo. He then received advanced training in musculoskeletal radiology through a clinical fellowship at the University of Toronto, Mount Sinai Hospital. He currently serves as medical director at Lab Checkup Laboratório Imagem and works as a musculoskeletal and interventional staff radiologist at Hospital Aliança, Regidor, Salvador, Bahia. He's also a member of the Society of Skeletal Radiology. Please, Lucas. Thank you, Aline, for the, thank you for the introduction and thank you, Hilary, for the invitation. I'm just gonna share my screen here. Can you see it? Yes, but it's not on presenter mode. Okay, yes. so, so my case is a 16 year old a male. He's an active handball player and the indication for the MRI was a loss of posterior elbow extension with posterior elbow, uh, posterior medial elbow pain. So the clinician wants to rule out loose body and joint pathology. So the pain is worse with U extension and during the acceleration phase of the throwing cycle. And on physical examination, there is focal tenderness to palpation over posterior medial elbow. So these are coronal T2 weighted sequences. As you can see here, there is some signal change in relation to the proximal fibers of the UCL. There is also bone marrow edema at the medial epicondyle and at the olecranon apophysis. And as you can see here, the lateral structures are normal. On the axial situated, there is, uh, you can see, appreciate the edema. And also the ulnar nerve, it's quite bright. It's almost approaching the signal of the vessels. And on the T1 rated sequences, you can better ap appreciate the, how the irregular and widened is the olecranon apophysis. So this is a good old case of a Petrus elbow with valgus extension overload syndrome, UCL partial tearing and ulnar neuritis. So the VEOS is a pathophysiologic model for common elbow injuries in overhead athletes. So these patients that get very high valgus stress at the elbow, especially during late cocking and early acceleration phase of the throwing cycle, which leads to medial, extreme medial tension forces extreme lateral compression forces, and they also get shear type forces at the posterior medial aspect of the joint. So the pitcher's elbow is a constellation of findings. The medial tensile forces are responsible for a specific bone and soft tissue injuries. The lateral compressive forces are responsible for OCD injuries at the radiocapillar joint, and the shear stress injuries uh, cause posterior medial impingement and olecranon stress fractures. So the UCL is uh, made up of uh, three bands. As we know, the anterior band is the most important. And it experiences tensile forces during the late cocking and acceleration phases of the throwing cycle, which leads to attenuation and progressive laxity. So this example shows an acute case of a high grade partial tearing of the proximal fibers of the MCL. There is another case showing complete detachment with extension to the FCU origin. Uh, the anterior bands of the UCL uh, originates from the inferior aspect of the epicondyle and inserts in a sublime tubercle. And there is a pitfall that we have to know. Uh, its distal insertion may vary from the joint line to up to three millimeters from the articulation. There is a specific partial thickness there of the distal anterior band near the sublime tubercle, which has been described as having a T-shaped appearance, the so-called T-sign. 
And then we go to the lateral side, the lateral compressive forces at the radial capillar joint uh, can lead to OCD lesions, usually in the dominant hands, it's an overuse injury. And uh, why does this happen often in the capitellum? Uh, people think that's probably related to the tenuous blood supply. So this chronic compressive forces, they lead to ischemia and necrosis. So as you can see here, there's a large osteochondral defect at the anterior aspect of the capitellum. And then we go to the third phase, which is the extension overload. So they are pitching, and when they are in full extension, the olecranon keeps uh, jamming on the back of the fossa, and this can cause symptoms of impingement. It's an overuse injury and results in uh, injuries with chondrosis and osteophytes and olecranon fractures. So there is an example here, it's an MR arthrogram. So there is a thickening and remodeling of the UCL. And on the axial images, you can see that there is some chondrosis at the posterior medial aspect of the joint with contrast interposition. And I just wanna share this article very quick as an interest one that came out recently on AGR and treat the assess this uh, new position which they call fever on unitrochal joint space measurements and evaluation of UCL injuries in pictures. In general terms, they concluded that the fever view improves diagnostic confidence, potentially improving MRI evaluation of throwing athletes. And uh, that's how they position the patient, lying on his side with the elbow flexed. They put some sandbags to induce a valgus stress. And as, it, as you can see here, the images were acquired through the UCL. And that's the beautiful image that they got. The UCL is stretched. You can see thickened, there is some signal change and also some widening of the space. And I think that's the last one. That's fever, no fever. As you can see, the, the UCL is thick. There's some signal change that is widening of the space. I think it was the last image. That's how I got. I thank you very much for your attention. Is, um, is Diego back? Yes, I am. Uh, I'm done. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> OK, OK. Good. Welcome back, Diego. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Diego Limos, who did his medical training at the Universidad Libre de Cali in Colombia, his country of origin. After that, he moved, he moved to the United States and started his radiology residency training <clears throat> at the Louisiana State University of New Orleans in Louisiana. But thanks to Hurricane Katrina, which was really a big hurricane, he was relocated to the University of Vermont, which is a very different uh, place in the United States, a little bit colder than New Orleans. Um, he completed his musculoskeletal uh, radiology fellowship at University of California, San Diego, and then returned to University of Vermont where he's been the musculoskeletal division chief since 2009. Dr. Lemos has published more than 20 articles and four book chapters and has presented many, many posters and electronic exhibits around the United States and around the world. He's an active uh, academic musculoskeletal radiologist on social media. He, he's a Twitterer and an Instagrammer and his handle is at DF Limos MD. Okay, Diego, share your screen. All right. Let's see if uh, can you guys hear me well? Yes. Okay. So thank you, uh, Hillary and Ellen, for the invitation again. It's a pleasure to participate again in this on this series. And uh, today I'm going to present. Uh, an interesting case that we had a, a few months ago. It's a 40 year old male who was actually water skiing here in Lake Champlain when he had a sudden uh, water skiing traction injury. So they both pulled too fast and he got a traction injury on his, on his shoulder. He wasn't able to continue uh, water skiing due to pain in the postural, postural medial aspect of the shoulder and back. And the pain actually continued over the next three weeks or so 
So he uh, consulted with, with those symptoms. Initial x-rays were obtained and that was followed by a CT and a subsequent um, MRI. These were the initial uh, radiographs, an AP neutral, a Grashi, and a transscapular view of the right shoulder. And um, at first glance, nothing really uh, jumps up, but uh, let me just show you this uh, come down magnified view where I think that we can appreciate a, an irregularity in the medial cortex of the proximal humeral diaphysis that was uh, concerning um, at the time a CT was obtained and this is a coronal uh, reformation that shows again the cortical irregularities. And uh, I think I have, a, yeah, and this is an axial at the same level uh, showing the, the, the same findings. So an MRI was subsequently obtained. Um, and here we have T1 non-fat sat, T2 fat sat, and T1 fat sat after intravenous contrast administration. So uh, let me show you the abnormality. You can see here focal area of alter intramedullary signal. Uh, the epicenter is actually that area of cortical irregularity. It's like as intense to skeletal muscle on T1 weighted images, hyper intense on fluid sensitive sequences and shows evidence of significant enhancement, both in the bone as well as in the adjacent soft tissues after intravenous contrast administration. And here you can see the area of the cortical irregularity and some of the peristial fragments there adjacent uh, to it. And as we continue going, you can see that the, and here we have a sagittal oblique uh, fluid sensitive sequence at the same level. And you can see the same findings with the focal uh, bone marrow edema at the time, um, very concerning uh, for, for actually a tumor but the clinical history didn't, didn't fit nor the imaging findings, uh, particularly on the MRI where you can see that there is focal hematoma and then you have these tendons inserting on that footprint in the medial cortex, posterior medial cortex, if you will, of the proximal humeral uh, diaphysis. And here you have actually some of the more cranial vertical uh, fibers of the latissimus dorsi tendon and part of the terse minor tendon that were pulled from the footprint in the, in the humerus. So uh, let me show you the, the axial images. Here you have uh, just distal to the level of the lower tendinous insertion of the subscap, almost at the muscular insertion level, you have the, the alleged the long head biceps tendon. And uh, as we get towards the area of abnormality, you can see here the pec coming there. And this is part of the latissimus dorsi. And uh, some of the fibers of the latissimus dorsi are pulled. The, the footprint of the latissimus dorsi is, is almost like 3.5 to 4 uh, centimeters. So somewhat similar. I think this case actually correlates, uh, complements well the, the beautiful peg case that was shown early. Um, but this one is not the peg, it's the latissimus dorsi and mainly the terse major. Uh, both of these tendons sometimes can have a common uh, footprint but there actually can be separate footprints. I'll show you some cadaveric pictures in, 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 in a couple of minutes. So you can see the, the focal hematoma and the cortical discontinuity and the ables fracture uh, fragments. Uh, this was now like almost four weeks after the initial injury. So there's still some uh, edema and myofascial edema and fluid tracking along the planes. So the diagnosis was indeed an evolution of the terse major latissimus dorsi tendinous insertion at its distal footprint in the humerus. <clears throat> and uh, I thought that the case was interesting because the workup after the initial radiographs and the CT was, it was concerning for, for, for a neoplastic lesion. Um, but again, the clinical history didn't fit uh, too well. So we found this article on the yellow journal on AJR of the American Regen Rate Society the, from 2005. Um, it's a multi-institutional uh, article uh, work presented by Dr. Anderson, Suzanne Anderson and Lyne Steinbach from UCSF where they uh, presented five patients with a terrors of the latissimus dorsi that looked like a tumor. So they uh, coined the term pseudotumor of the upper extremity in these particular patients. And those uh, five patients, uh, here they are. The first, the first one was uh, just uh, not really history of trauma, just several years of shoulder pain. Second patient was uh, minor trauma. 
but the last three patients were all athletes and sports injuries, a basketball slam dunking injury, a volleyball player uh, that was a spike in a ball and developed the pain, and then a, an Olympic vaulting gymnast with, with chronic pain. So this is an injury that can certainly occur in the setting of sports, uh, of a sports injury. This is one of the cases, uh, one of the five cases presented on the AJR article, and it shares uh, several similarities with, with our case. You can see the critical irregularity along the medial aspect of the uh, proximal humeral diaphysis. Uh, there was a bone scan that showed the focal area of increased uh, rate of tracer uptake. And you can see that the MRI is very similar to, to our case. Um, this is another uh, article, uh, this one on the American Journal of Sports Medicine from 1998 uh, from Dr. Spinner and colleagues about an evolution injury of the conjoint tendons of the latissimus dorsi and the trans major muscles at the humeral footprint. And you can see that the x-ray uh, shows again a cortical irregularity in the, in the proximal uh, humeral diaphysis. And you can see the MRI showing the evulsive uh, findings, the soft tissue edema and fluid tracking along the path of the torn uh, tendons. So um, not all injuries happen actually at the, at the footprint, at the humeral insertion. That's the most common occurrence, but not infrequently or occasionally you can see uh, rather injuries along the myotendinous junction. Altogether, these, these injuries of the latissimus dorsi, either in isolation, the LD, or just the terrorist major, or both are not that common. They are relatively uncommon. Um, but you can see them in some particular uh, sports. So uh, this is an article that some of our colleagues from Spain with Dr. Pedret and, and Ramon Valles and Fernando, they published this, this article about four elite athletes that uh, they found injuries of the latissimus dorsi, but those injuries in this case, in these four cases, were not actually at the distal humeral insertion, but along the um, distal myotendinous junction. So the four patients, one was actually a tennis player, one was a bike trial athlete, and the other two were uh, Pelota Basca uh, players, which is a specific uh, type of sports that they play in the, in the País Vasco, where they throw a specific ball, you know, and they, they play that. So the two uh, Pelota Basca players actually suffer ray injuries. And I'm going to show just the images of one of those uh, cases. But one thing that I want to emphasize is this particular anatomy of the latissimus dorsi and its relationship with the terse major. Um, they can have this common tendinous insertion or they can have separate but adjacent footprints. But what is interesting is that the, um, the latissimus dorsi kind of rotates on itself just before its insertion in the in the in the bicipital groove in the, the tubercular groove of the of the humerus okay and uh, here are the footprints in the lateral and medial uh, portions of the intertubercular groove for the latissimus uh, for the pec for the pectoralis major for the latissimus dorsi and for the teres major so the mnemonic that uh, sometimes we can use to remember those is a uh, plate for uh, pectoralis one, uh, latissimus uh, two, and terse major uh, three. So uh, remember, remember that. And this is one of the cases that our colleagues from Spain publish on, on Sketa radiology article from 2011. Um, and as you can see the injury, this was one of the Pelota Basca uh, players. Actually, this was the initial MRI at the time of the, uh, the initial, the first injury with, with the injury center along the uh, latissimus dorsum tendinous junction. And this was a ray injury that happened like four weeks after the initial, the initial episode. And this one was more distal and the edema was extending all the way to the distal tendinous insertion into the humerus, which was um, attenuated. So just remember that not all, not all injuries occur at the distal insertion. Not, not all of them are just soft tissue evolutions, like they can pull a little piece of bone, like in the case that I showed you and some of the examples that we already share. And sometimes the injuries can be along the myotendinous junction. So a couple of uh, nice diagrams uh, from Ratzers about this particular anatomy. You can see the latissimus dorsi, and you can see how it turns on itself and its relationship with the terrace major. This is an uh, anti a posterior view, and this is seen from the front and anterior projection where they cut the long head biceps tendon and the short head biceps tendon and the coracobrachialis and the pec was reflected. So you can see very nicely the relationship of the latissimus dorsi, which is more anterior and extends more cranial than the footprint of the terrace major. 
These are two beautiful uh, cadaveric dissections done by Dr. Chala, by Jorge Chala, that was published actually on an article in, in the journal of uh, arthroscopy from 2018. And it can show you here initially the latissimus darsi uh, footprint. Here's where the peg inserts, and here is the, the teres major. So he actually reflected here the, the, the latissimus darsi to the side, and you can see that there are two separate footprints for these uh, two tendons that are adjacent to one to the other. They're like four millimeters at the most of, of separation between the footprints and sometimes they're just together, but that's uh, the anatomic relationship. And on MR imaging, we can see injuries of both tendons or just an isolated latissimus dorsi or an isolated ter teres major. Um, Dr. Uh, Holly Spotter and colleagues from the HSS, <clears throat> from the Hospital of Special Surgery, uh, in New York, uh, published this article in the Orthopedic Journal of Sports Medicine about the MR imaging grading system of terse of the latissimus dorsi and terse major. So I'm just going to share with you the, the classification system. I don't use it like this, but it's important in terms of how you can describe this type of, of injury. So whether it's a grade one, which is just a strain with a little bit of fluid tracking along the fibers of the terse major and the latissimus dorsi, or, or a type two, which is a partial tear, um, at the footprint versus a grade at three and four that are complete tears. And the designation of A or B means, if, uh, what it means is if the tear occurs at the footprint or along the myotendinous junction. And once that you decide that, if the, if the retraction is less than two centimeters of the torn fibers, then it's a grade three. If it's more than two centimeters, it's a grade four. And this paper was about just uh, professional pitchers and uh, they found that the patients with, with more than two centimeter of repression of the torn fibers did very well with surgery, but actually uh, the other professional pitchers that didn't have grade fours, but grade one, two or three uh, didn't require surgery and returned to play uh, with same level as, as, as before. So there's no definite uh, treatment for these uh, injuries. Some people do operate, some other do not, but patients relatively do well in these cases and they can return to play. Uh, this is another article uh, about, uh, I just wanted to share it because it's a myotendinous junction injury. And these ones are less common than the distal insertion uh, terms that I just, uh, that I just showed you. Uh, this is um, a case series about baseball players from three major league baseball clubs over a total of 10 seasons. And they had access to all that data and they were able to pull up like 10 patients that had uh, those injuries and all of them returned it to play whether they had operative or non-operative treatment. Here you have I know, more articles about injuries of these uh, two structures, the latissimus dorsi and the, and the terse major tennis player, baseball pitchers, rock climbers, uh, boxers, um, crickets here for our friends from Australia. Uh, they can also have this kind of injury. They presented this nice paper with four patients. You can have isolated injuries of the terrace major. And here you have several examples on baseball players, as well as two of them with water skin injuries, such as our patient uh, that injured here in the lake. And since this is in conjunction with Brazil, I, could, I need to mention that you can also have injuries to these structures in soccer, in football. And this is a case that it was reported, a case from Sao Paulo about a goalkeeper that had that injury. And this is the specific movement that he was doing when he threw the, the ball and fell, and fell the pain. And here are the pictures with the asymmetry in the soft tissues and the tremendous uh, hematoma and swelling about the, um, at the distal insertion and proximal retraction of the torn fibers of the, of the terrace major mainly. So in summary, I show you a case of, of an, a pseudotumoral appearance of a bony abulsion of the L of the latissimus dorsi and teres major. Uh, remember that they can look a little bit aggressive uh, on it, but if you have the clinical history and with all the imaging and findings put together and the different imaging modalities, you can come up with this uh, diagnosis. Remember that it's important to mention if it's both tendons or one of them, if it's at the footprint or proximal to it at the myotendinous junction or not, and if the degree of retraction, if it's less than two centimeters or more than two centimeters. Um, not everything is a pseudotumor. We had this unfortunate case of a real tumoral lesion on a patient in the same location. Unfortunately, a met on a non-small cell lung cancer 
that occur in the same area. So yes, it's a pseudo tumor, but you can have real tumors in that area. This is the X-ray. So I thank you all for your attention and thanks again for the invitation. Diego, don't go away. Okay, um, I'll stay. Uh, that was wonderful. I'm, I'm a little, you know, now I'm a little depressed that you ended on such an unfortunate uh, case. But um, my question is, in my experience, even with pretty large avulsions, um, I see relatively minimal marrow edema. How do you explain the degree of marrow edema and enhancement? Is it somehow related to the fact that he waited three days to present? I mean, those cases that were published as pseudotumors, they were not, they, they didn't look like pseudotumors, frankly. Yours looks, you know, a real like a tumor. Yeah, um, I think there is a combination of both. I think that the time that some time elapsed between the time of the initial injury and the time of imaging, can explain that now. It was a high, it was a significant injury. And if you if you keep in mind the size of the footprint there, I didn't have time to, to show everything, but uh, there is uh, there are very elegant uh, articles in the literature about the geography of the of the footprints of these two tendons, and they can be quite long over that segment. So conceivably, if you have a tear that involves the entire footprint, and particularly you have this avulsive bone marrow edema. This avulsion, bony avulsion with critical irregularities, you can have that that uh, much bone marrow edema. And as you know, the bone marrow edema can enhance like this. It was concerning. I'm going to tell you the truth. I mean, it was we were worried, particularly with the MRI, with the CT and with the plain films. The MRI and the clinical history help us, uh, and the fact that I mean, it's flow. it's hematomas enhancing, right? I yeah. mean, that's yeah. that's enormous. Yeah, that's and. Um, uh, one thing that I didn't have time to show, but also to include in the differential is um, hydroxyapatite crystal deposition. Had, exactly. I have had cases, actually I have a beautiful case that I just didn't have time to include it with a uh, hat in, at the insertion of the peg major and the, that, uh, the, the comet tail sign causing the erosion of the cortex and then uh, hydroxyapatite deposition at the footprint of the latissimus dorsi and at the footprint of the, of the tertius major. So, uh, and as you know, there are a few articles in the imaging literature that show not only the critical irregularity, but focal areas of significant bone marrow edema adjacent to the focus of heart, even in the absence of cortical erosion. So I think that, uh, you know, the, the bone marrow edema and the enhancement can be misleading, but I think that biomechanically, uh, the time of injury between the, the imaging and the, and the trauma and the, the size of the footprint can explain why it was uh, so focal. And the fact that the follow-up MRI show resolution of-, of Well, the that helps, yeah, sure. Yeah, that helps a lot. The patient is still alive. So, <laughs> so Very uh, good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Eleni, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, from Marcus. When pack major lesion is not suspected, oh, he, he, asked, he answered already. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I can, if, yeah, if you want, I can. I just typed it. Sorry. I can. Uh, if you want, I can say to you whatever you guys prefer. Yeah. Uh, yeah, please explain. So, so wait, finish the question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, when pec major uh, lesion is not suspected clinically and you're running a routine shoulder protocol and then you suspect that there is a pec major lesion but the shoulder uh, MRI don't go far enough distally, uh, what would be a good sequence of plan to make the diagnosis without running a whole pectoralis um, protocol or mm -hmm. would you run a whole uh, protocol? Yeah, protocol. yeah I, I understand, yeah. Um, so if you're lucky enough to, to see that there was something around there and you're just you know close by uh, and there is time to do something, uh, first question is how much how much time do you have to do whatever you need to do? So let's suppose you have just less than 10 minutes, okay? So you need to run some kind of rescue sequence, even if to be able to report that there is something there, it's more or less this, and you know what? He needs a new study dedicated and whatever. But uh, I, I, the two things I would suggest would be uh, your shoulder coil is placed there, but there is some bad signal, but there is some signal that you can use to go a little more distal in the shaft of the humans. So I would just do an axial, probably T1 and maybe an axial stir, but um, 
the idea is to better characterize the pectoral stand on itself um, and maybe a little bit of the myotendinous junction. Um, so you could use the field of view of the shoulder, but you have the axiom, just keep going down and you're going to see the, the tendon attachment quite well, right? Uh, and actually, if you start to pay attention to all shoulder uh, MRIs, we actually we almost see it in, in many of them. Now, if you want to get a little more signal, especially because your, your, your coil is already kind of the, the end of it, uh, you can increase the field of view. And then with that, you, you, you actually include a little bit of the myotendinous junction. So it can go like, I don't know, like 19 or maybe even 20 field of view. Uh, you're going to lose a bit of resolution, but now uh, you get more signals, noise, it's a little better the image. So I would do an axial T1, I think, and I would do a fluid sensitive sequence, which because I know the fat suppression is going to be bad, I would go for a stir. Now, that is going to take probably more five minutes for you to do. Uh, the last thing I would do would be a coronal stir. You can use the, the gantry coil if you want and use a field of view of like 22, 25 to include the pectoralis to the humerus and don't expect big resolution at all. The idea is just to see if there is a collection where there is edema or something like that. So at least you can stage more or less the thing. Great, thank you. My pleasure. Um... I had a question for Lucas. Um, I thought I read that the T sign has been determined to be unreliable and can be a normal appearance. What's your experience and opinion on this matter? It's a very good question, which I don't have a good answer. Uh, the problem with those lesions is that they are usually treated non they, they never go to the OR, so you never know if there was a lesion or not. So uh, what I usually do is if the patient's symptomatic and the contrast is extending too far, I would say five millimeters, more than five, something like this, I call it. But I don't, I don't have a good answer. I, I'd like to hear your opinion on the others. Anybody else in this crew have an idea? Okay, we're stumped. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and I have a question for Francisco. Um, when you see a patient with uh, Moreau Lavallee, will you attempt aspiration first, regardless of uh, uh, when the in injury happened, how chronic it is, and the imaging appearance? Um, and if so, do you inject any sort of sclerosing agent? I know that the issue with Morel Lavallee lesions, which is what makes them special, um, is that they can uh, um, uh, reaccumulate and uh, require surgery. Um, uh, after aspiration, do you find that it helps to bind the limb or use a compression dressing? I've only, I've only done a few of these, so I, I wonder what your experience is. Okay, it's an excellent uh, question here because we can discuss some, some treatment options and how we use uh, in our protocol here. So the first question is, is this a professional player, for example, or it's just a, a regular patient that is not a professional? So that's the first question, because if he's a professional player, it's an entirely different uh, uh, protocol. So you want to try to recover uh, the, the patient and make him be back to the game. Uh, as soon as possible. So we try to shorten the time to, to the recover as long as we, we can. Uh, so if it's a professional player, we usually uh, try to aspirate this and to uh, put a, a compression band in an earlier phase, in acute phase. But it's not uh, in all the cases, for example, in uh, all kinds of patients. If it's a regular patient, we wait until for two weeks. And, and if, because sometimes it, uh, uh, the, the body will observe uh, spontaneously this collection. And so if we, we notice uh, in the follow-up exams that in these two first weeks, the volume of the collection is reducing in a significant way, for example, more than 20 or 25 or 30% uh, in each week. So we can wait 
for the, the spontaneous uh, absorption of this fluid collection. After two weeks, if you don't observe any uh, improvement, uh, so we can try to aspirate. Uh, and the sclerosing agents, uh, in some uh, places they use kind of antibiotics and other uh, sclerotic agents, but here in our service, we don't use it, okay? I don't have experience using this. We just aspirate and we put the, the compression uh, compressing dressing. Thank you. Uh, I mean, and but but my question, uh, the first part of the question was, will you try to aspirate even if it's more chronic, or or if the appearance shows that it's encapsulated? Is it worth a try regardless of the appearance? Okay, if it's uh, more than two weeks, it, it's uh, not, uh, the image try to uh, shows chronicity and it has our. Uh, if it still have fluid uh, inside it. It's interesting to try to aspirate, but sometimes when it got chronic, it's not uh, so uh, a well-defined fluid collection. It's uh, infiltrated and we don't have uh, a, a main uh, place to aspirate. So it's not so easy, it depends on the case. Right. Uh, when it's chronic uh, uh, organizing hematoma, sometimes you don't have anything else to aspirate, but if you have a, a fluid collection, well-defined, I, I, I think it's very helpful. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any more questions here in the chat box. Um, we will do a short break in December and we will get back in January. So thank you all for joining us today. And with that, I will end the session. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye. Thank Bye you. Again. Bye. Bye. Have a great day. Bye.